Seven men and a boy were killed in the shooting. At least three of the men, all striking coal miners, one a leader, apparently executed in cold blood by Colorado National Guardsmen who had taken them captive. As the sun set, the militia moved into the camp itself, and an inferno lit up the darkening sky, reducing most of the makeshift village to ashes. It wasn't until the next morning that the bodies of two mothers and eleven children were discovered where they had taken shelter in a dirt bunker beneath one of the tents. The raging fire had sucked the oxygen from the air below, suffocating the families as they hid from the gun battle. Hi, I'm Dan. And I'm Jake, and we're both public high school teachers. We have a lot of topics that we don't often get to talk about with students in the classroom, and one of those topics is labor history in America. We're both members of our teachers' unions, and we think that's important, partially because there's a long history of union members fighting and dying for the rights that we take for granted today. The enforcement of labor laws, mandatory breaks, and even things like the right to be paid in real money and not company script are all things that were hard fought for by union members. This fight has been going on for literally hundreds of years, but the story isn't often told, and how it's told is in the interest of a lot of different political groups. And don't get me wrong, this video has a viewpoint, but we've got all our sources listed down in the description, so you can do some fact-checking if you'd like. One incident of particular interest to this labor history happened only about three hours south of where Jake and I grew up, but we didn't know the story until we actively sought it out as adults. 17 years of schooling in Colorado, and I guess just... Nobody thought it was worth mentioning? Described by author Wallace Stegner as one of the bleakest and blackest events in American labor history, that incident is known today as the Ludlow Massacre. Located about three hours south of Denver via Interstate 25, Ludlow is a small prairie town nestled at the base of the Sangre de Cristo Rockies, just north of the New Mexico border. In the first decades of the 20th century, it was part of a thriving mining area, with 11,000 coal miners working, most of them employed by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, owned by John D. Rockefeller. Yes, that John D. Rockefeller, the wealthiest American to ever live. Ludlow wasn't the first casualty in labor relations in America. It was part of a larger narrative called the Colorado Coalfield War, in which employers and employees clashed for literally years at a time. In fact, for the previous 20 years or so, there had been incidents of violence across the nation as workers pressed for social change. Bombs in Chicago, a shootout in Pennsylvania, and beatings in Los Angeles were the direct result of coal miners, steel workers, and others pushing for better working conditions. Herbert Gutman notes in a 1977 article that the high concentration of immigrant labor at Ludlow was mainly seen as a frustration for mine owners, as workers brought their own work habits and customs to the company. Those miners had to quickly adapt to their cultural outlook and the expectations of the American work week, which didn't always line up with the religious holy days, the birth festivals, or holidays from the old country. Tension was baked in because this uniform expectation put in place by those in charge that largely privileged the owner's mostly Protestant views. Workers fresh to the mines struggled with the cultural demands imposed on them by the irregularities and disciplines of industrial labor. In September of 1913, the United Mine Workers of America, a nationwide mining union, helped about 10,000 of those workers go on strike protesting for better pay and better conditions. Specifically, the miners wanted the eight-hour workday enforced, a 10-cent pay raise, and mine safety regulations to be established in Southern Colorado. In Colorado, miners were dying at twice the rate of the national average because the companies wouldn't write or enforce safety regulations. One of the union's demands was that people be allowed to work, live, and shop outside the company town because under the current system, rents, groceries, and all other purchases went back in the pocket of the company, who could set wages and prices at whatever they liked. Technically, this wasn't legal, but the coal companies were so powerful and they could afford to just ignore the law and it wasn't enforced. Rockefeller and company president Jesse F. Wellborn rejected the union's demands outright, and the miners went on strike. Evicted from their homes, which were, of course, owned by the company, they erected tent colonies in the areas nearby. 
the people there represented a hugely diverse population of people, representing 32 different nationalities and 27 different languages spoken. Ludlow itself housed about 1,200 miners in at least 100 white tents. According to Mary Thomas, who published a memoir about the strike, the actual living conditions were pretty bleak due to the storms and the cold. But the community was pretty remarkable, with residents describing a beautiful new city of white tents and a dignified campaign for human rights. They created a small democracy in the colony with relative racial equality. They even built a baseball field with volunteer labor and played when the weather was good. But at the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, things were less harmonious, with their mines hemorrhaging money because they didn't have enough workers, plus the cost of employing armed guards due to the tensions with the union, the price of the strike was mounting, which, of course, was the goal of the strike. In an attempt to pressure the union and end the strike, the number of guards and weapons owned by the company was increased, numbers which were matched by the United Mine Workers sending more arms to the miners. One group hired by the mining bosses in hopes of breaking the strike was the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency, whose tactics significantly increased danger in the area, doing things like firing indiscriminately into sleeping families' tents. The Baldwin Feltz Agency also shipped a weapon in from Denver, dubbed the Death Special, a car mounted with steel plates on the sides and two machine guns on the top. Incidents of violence happened throughout the fall of 1913, with both sides claiming victims in shootouts. Many of the colonists started digging cellars underneath their tents in case of gunfire. The Colorado National Guard was called to Ludlow in October due to the escalation in violence and initially was met with friendliness by the strikers, inviting them into their tents and to their social events. Labor activist Mother Jones visited the tent city, rallying strikers with her signature brand of fiery rhetoric. Her presence unnerved the coal bosses, and she was arrested several times, but upon leaving Colorado, she spoke about the strike at Ludlow to the rest of the nation. Colorado Fuel and Iron saw people like Mother Jones as interlopers who incited violence and wanted to increase their number of armed guards and soldiers, but as the strike wore on for months, with absolutely no end in sight, many of those National Guardsmen requested to be sent home to their families in Denver, resulting in the few experienced and impartial peacekeeping forces trickling away from the area. As departing Guardsmen were replaced by less experienced ones, George P. West observed that the Guard no longer offered even a pretense of fairness or impartiality, and that its units in the field had degenerated into a force of professional gunmen and adventurers who were economically dependent and subservient to the will of the coal operators. On April 19th of 1914, most of the camp was celebrating Greek Orthodox Easter, with a community dinner and entertainment provided by some of the Greek strikers. The baseball field, which had been out of commission for the winter, was finally hosting some leisure games. During one of those games, National Guardsmen apparently came onto the field and began to taunt some of the strikers, telling them to enjoy themselves while they could because the National Guard was planning their own roast. The following morning, National Guardsmen sent several soldiers to Ludlow's train depot, attempting to find one man in the colony. Upset with the colony's leader telling them that there was nobody in the camp by that name, they came back later in larger numbers to try to force a meeting. A group of strikers then had a meeting where they apparently decided that any further attempt by the National Guard to enter the camp would be met with armed resistance. Seeing men from this meeting moving into the camp then prompted the National Guard to place a machine gun on a nearby hill in preparation of fighting and the National Guard's commanding officer, Major Patrick Marock, believing a fight to be imminent, set off two bombs, which caused the full firefight to break out. It was clear the colonists were outgunned, so many of the strikers sought only to keep National Guardsmen away from the tent city to protect their families and what few belongings they had. Many of the colonists took refuge in the cellars that they had dug underneath their tents earlier. Some fled to nearby ranches that they knew to be sympathetic, others hid in a dry well for most of the day. According to Mary Thomas, suddenly the prairie was covered with human beings running in all directions like ants. We all ran as we were, some with babies on their backs and whatever clothes they were wearing, leaving our tent homes behind us, snatching what we could take with us immediately, not even thinking through the clouds of panic. We were terrified. A fire was started with the intention of burning down the tent city. Even the National Guard's later investigative panel concluded that the Guardsmen had ceased to be an army and become a mob. Colonists were shot, beaten, and burned by the National Guard, the higher detective agencies, and the company gunmen. 
Fighting continued into the night until the colony had been completely burned down. In the morning, the tent colony was gone. Furniture was destroyed and almost no belongings remained. As people took stock of their losses, it was discovered that four women and 11 children had tried to hide in the cellar of one of the larger tents, and 13 of them had asphyxiated when their tent was consumed by flames. Ultimately, 25 people were killed at the camp that day. There were demands for an investigation into the events at Ludlow on a national stage and a push for a change in the conditions for the coal miners. The United Mine Workers and other labor unions did their best to publicize the massacre, but unfortunately, it was overshadowed by the United States invasion of Mexico just two days later. National attention shifted to Mexico and all but the most tuned in to the labor movement forgot about Ludlow swiftly. By the end of 1914, despite intervention from Washington, no agreement had been reached between the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company and the strikers, and the strike was unceremoniously declared over. The United Mine Workers of America were sucked dry of both money and resources, and people on both sides of the fight were very tired. After the strike ended, more than 400 criminal indictments were filed against striking miners and union leaders in Southern Colorado. Not a single Colorado National Guardsman or Colorado Fuel and Iron employee was likewise arrested. The story of Ludlow was neither a big win for the miners or the companies, and lacked a satisfying ending that advanced the labor cause. The anti-socialist sentiment of the Red Scare one generation later buried the story deeper in the history books because of the political leanings of the prominent labor organizers involved. A couple of years ago, I decided to drive to Ludlow on a whim. It's way off the highway down a couple of dirt roads at the base of the hills. There's a little picnic shelter and an American flag and a statue with the death pit cellar. There's some pieces of iconography for the United Mine Workers. And despite the National Park Service saying it's one of the best preserved labor sites, archaeologically speaking, it just feels forgotten while you're there. I've been there three times now, and I've never seen another person there while I was visiting. And the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company? It's still around albeit under a different name. What made the strife at Ludlow a focus of attention was that many women and children were the victims of industrial unrest. The union called it a massacre, making it an issue with which to appeal for national support against alleged corporate abuses in Colorado. The response was overwhelming. But for many union members, including ourselves, Ludlow represents labor's struggle to gain basic workplace rights in the face of corporate power. It portrays the unwillingness of gigantic corporations to make even glacial change in favor of their workers, and it shows the sacrifice that everyday people have to make in order to secure changes that future generations might not even realize were something that people had to ask for. While corporations like the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company have deep wells of resources and friends in high places, the average worker has almost no influence unless working collectively with others. As we watch fast food employees and maybe even Amazon workers try to unionize for better pay and better conditions, we can't help but see similarities between that and what the colonists at Ludlow died for in 1914. Resurrected with the light.